Traveler, you must decide. Reality, dreams, fantasy. Where does one stop and the others begin? Your fantasies are integral to who you are. They affect how you perceive the world around you. What is natural becomes supernatural. Reality becomes hyper-real. Are you ready to leave what you know? Are you ready to journey to the end of time? I hope you are ready for a fantastic journey. For two decades, Rodney Matthews has been taking travelers on a voyage of pure imagination. You are in control of this journey. You are the traveler. I will simply act as your guide and occasionally bring you back to Earth. Remember, as you travel, there is always a goal. One is to see and to learn. The other is more complex. Traveler, not every journey you make will be simple. For many years, wanderers such as you have tried to unlock the secret of the castle of Tanalor. All have tried and failed. You may be just like the others, or you may be better. Those with tenacity will receive their rewards. As you travel to the end of time, keep in mind that there are 20 hidden clues to be discovered. You have found where the clue is buried when your cursor reveals Tanalor. Collect this clue. At any time, you may see the clues you have collected by clicking on the tablet. Each discovered clue will be etched upon the ancient tablet. Some clues are vital, others merely confuse. Complete the phrase that unlocks the myth of time and discover the wealth of Tanalarn and your... Good luck. Hello. I'm Rodney Matthews. I'm going to join you on your journey. For a look at the creative process or to take a tour of my studio, click on My World. If you would rather meet Elric or go in search of forever, try Other Worlds. I'll see you when you get there. Welcome to My World the world in which I create images of fantasy. I'd like to give you the opportunity to discover a little bit about myself and what led me to this sometimes bizarre field. By choosing personal history, you can find out about my background and influences. Pick behind the scenes and I'll take you into my studio and into the beautiful scenery of Wales. You can even try your hand at putting together an illustration. To understand the artist, you must understand the person, where he came from, how he grew up, what his influences were, how his work evolved. My father was, was handy with a pencil as well. He, he used to draw images for me as a child and get me to complete them. He would start a, a, a simple drawing and I would have to make something of it. So that sharpened the talent somewhat. There's an expression, Jack of all trades, master of none, and his name was Jack, but he seemed to master most things he put his hands to.
pencil. My father was, was handy with a pencil as well. He
In 1985, the artist and his family moved to North Wales. Some say rugged, inhospitable, windswept. He says inspirational. It is time for you to choose where to go. Ever since he was a child, Rodney Matthews has been fascinated with the beauty of nature, spending hours roaming the countryside. So much of what he sees around him eventually becomes incorporated into his work. Insects, trees, shorelines, cliffs. An avid photographer, he captures what surrounds him and later references them for specific projects. He does not simply transfer these images to the page. Instead, he bends, stretches, and exaggerates them until they become something new again. One of the questions I'm asked most is, where do you get your ideas from? One of the things which makes fantasy art convincing is to ensure that it is anchored down to things that people know of, earthly things that they know of. And whilst fantasy is a process of exaggeration and change and embellishment, at the same time, most people need to have some reference point as an anchor. Rodney himself is very firmly anchored in what he sees and what he believes. You know, since I used to keep insects in glass jars, I've never really lost a fascination. And I sometimes imagine what it must be like to be this size amongst such huge foliage. Sometimes the earth itself is my inspiration. The, uh, the rocks and the, the rugged landscape of this area. You can see this rock behind me is uh, the sort of thing that uh, is the stock inspiration of fantasy.
The sky must be the most inspiring thing of all. And I know that uh, we tend to look at the sky when we're contemplating the reason for life itself. You know, we tend to uh, look at the sky when we're looking for God. And it's never the same. The clouds are always different. It can be very light or very dark, but fascinating all the same. I very often take my camera when I'm out walking in the country because I find that I can um, discover lots of things that are useful in my work, such as maybe a tree or a, a root formation under a tree or something which can be uh, exaggerated and incorporated into a fantasy design. I'm very fortunate as an artist in that I can work from home and while my customers are in far-flung parts of the country or even of the world, they're happy to uh, communicate with me by means of telephone or fax or postage and it suits me very well to work in this very quiet part of North Wales away from the rat race. 
My studio contains everything I need. I have uh, brushes, inks, paper, reference books, airbrush. These are the tools of the trade and so when I come in in the morning all I need to bring with me is my imagination. I refer back to my pencil sketch for detail as I work and this particular job is a record cover. It's slightly smaller than most of my artwork and at this size I anticipate this will take me just short of two weeks from start to finish. The illustrator's role is often to visualize another's idea, an author's writing, a band's music. The artist creates an image in his mind that defines that idea, then puts that image on paper. No one can better tell you of this process than he. I would like to tell you something of the anatomy of a painting. First of all, a customer comes to me, and if it's a record cover, for example, I'm usually given a demo tape or a previous album. Uh, sometimes something as skimpy as just a, a loose description or an idea. And part of the secret of this, of this thing is, is to distill what is being said, because it may come from several different people, and try to discover the essence of what they require. The way I I start is to produce, usually in front of the customer, several little rough pencil sketches and then I go away and, and I work these up rather more finished and I give a few alternatives. The thing I do avoid is showing people something that I don't like myself because that is the one they'll always choose. Then I uh, define the image rather more accurately on tracing paper. I define all the outlines very, very accurately and trace it down onto a piece of uh, commercial artboard, hard surfaced artboard with a very hard pencil. I've sometimes described my work as painting by numbers because the technique I use is to spend quite a lot of time considering what I'm about to do. And then uh, I have a well-formed idea of the colours and the, the content, the detail of each section. And then I like to finish a section almost completely before I move on to another area. So at uh, most stages I'm left with completely white pieces of board showing. I then mask off areas for airbrush spraying. I usually spray any sky area first with the airbrush and work from the sky down to the distant landscape areas to the foreground detail. The main characters are usually painted by hand with a, a small sable-haired brush and the medium I, I use normally is a, an acrylic ink. I don't like to apply highlights with an opaque white as some artists do. I, I like to work around the highlights and I usually do the dark areas first because I'm using a transparent ink and uh, I can layer the ink to, uh, to achieve the weight of colour I need. The final process is, is a touching up of, of detail, basically, and to, to balance one image against another. Sometimes I have to put a general overall spray on a certain area just to uh, either take it back into the distance or uh, maybe make it more prominent. Elements of an illustration are defined by its use. Is it a record cover, a book, a poster? Will there be type and logos? Good composition requires study and practice and a natural ability. Discover for yourself the elements necessary to create a work of fantasy art.
Traveler, you are brave. You have chosen to enter a realm of fantasy, a realm of pure imagination. You must open your mind to what you do not know, to what you do not understand. At the conclusion of your journey, you may see with new eyes, or your imagination may remain as clouded as before. It is up to you. I did my first calendar in 1978, Wizardry and Wild Romance. That was a title Michael Moorcock gave it. And it was based on the, the works of Michael Moorcock, uh, a cross-section of most of his fantasy writing of the time, and followed the uh, success of 12 full-scale posters I'd done the previous year. But my calendars since then have been compilation calendars. They've been made up of various projects I've done during the previous year. With the exception of 1988 and 1990 uh, from Wondrous Tales and the Storybook Collection, which were circular calendars, cir circular images, and uh, because of this it uh, earned the name of the toilet seat calendar. I like the prospect of illustrating the duffel puds made happy because I, I like the little characters and the humour in them, the single foot in particular and their uh, gnome-like faces. And I like the allegorical writing of C.S. Lewis very much. Wind in the Willows is a book that appeals to me very much and I selected this particular image from it, the Formidable Four, uh, because of the, the interior and the interior of the room and the fact that it transported me back to English life of uh, bygone days.
Bilbo Baggins in this illustration appeals to me also because he becomes a hero in this instant, and yet he's, he's quite a, a mild uh, character. The spider also is something that uh, the shape of the spider terrifies some people. Um, it doesn't terrify me, but I, I can see that the, the shape of a moving spider, particularly if it becomes the size of a cow, must be <laughs> quite a horrific thing. I really love the work of J.R.R. Tolkien, and uh, in particular his descriptive qualities. Whilst being a very knowledgeable and educated man, uh, he was able to describe landscapes and things with uh, very simple words, but still get the thing across in a way that not many authors can. Tower of Flints is a feature in the city of Gormenghast, Mervyn Peak's city from the trilogy of the same name, populated by bizarre individuals. But what appealed to me here was the, um, the fact that the tower is in the uh, final stage of decay and uh, is a home to barn owls, exaggerated barn owls in this case, but very similar to the barn owls I have in my own outbuildings. I did my first calendar. It was the early 1970s. Big O posters in England saw and began to publish Rodney Matthews' work. From these first few images, an international career was launched, and poster sales climbed into the hundreds of thousands. In Search of Forever was um, about three weeks in the, in the making and uh, very near the end of the time 
a bomb exploded outside my studio and uh, devastated the studio with me in it, uh, IRA bomb. And uh, by a miracle, the artwork was saved and uh, I came out of the place without a scratch. message to this one is one of uh, beware of complacency. These people have built their little village on this tower to get away from their enemies, not uh, realizing that there's a, a four-winged eagle about to attack them.
with this image, Stop the Slaughter, I found that the humpback whale was uh, a good candidate in that um, it's a fantastic looking creature, so it fits in with my fantasy genre, but uh, it represents a species which, is, uh, which has been persecuted by man. And I'm really making a comment here against the plundering of our planet. A publisher asked me to illustrate a, a heavyweight machine, which would make a good subject for a poster. And uh, here I am in my studio wondering what it could be. And my eyes fall upon a model steam engine, which my father made years ago, the Flying Scotsman. And I thought, yes, if I could make that a bit more beastly and put some horns on it and uh, plenty of fire and smoke. And here we have it, the heavy metal hero.
I'm very fond of the writings of Lewis Carroll, but I was a bit apprehensive when tackling this subject, the March Hare's Table, because it's been done so well by other people, notably Arthur Rackham. But uh, I had some fun with this one because it reminded me of the uh, tea table here at home, um, although we do draw the line at uh, stuffing the dormouse in the teapot. This image was intended, first of all, as a record cover for a band called Stackridge, but was turned down by the manager of the band. It was then seen by a, a prominent poster publisher, and uh, he liked it and uh, asked me if I'd complete the artwork for a poster. And it was this image together with In Search of Forever, which lifted me from obscurity. Traveller, you can read, but can you see? Can you picture something in your mind's eye? Listen. From below were rising oddly wrought vessels, something like ships, but with huge round wheels at their sides, like the wheels of water clocks he had seen once at Picarade. Colored smoke issued from chimneys mounted on their decks, which swarmed with huge birds dressed in human clothing. These birds had multicolored plumage, curved beaks, and they held swords in their claws, while on their heads were strangely shaped black hats, on which blazed skulls with crossed bones beneath. What did you see? An image or a fragment? The artist can tell you what he sees. He cannot tell you how he sees. Listen, read, and try to see for yourself.
I like illustrating children's books because I feel I have more freedom there. I don't look down on designing for children because I, I feel they, they understand fantasy very well. I have a couple of children and I can bounce ideas off them and see where I'm going. The children's book called Yendor came about in a, in a rather unusual way in that I produced uh, the, the whole amount of the illustrations for it in advance and then I turned to a friend of mine who was not actually a writer but a musician and said, Graham, Graham Smith his name, do you think you could write a story around these images? The Field Guide to Nasties is a project I started in 1977. It's still unfinished because I, I just do a bit to it now and again in time permitting. But I remember in the first instance I looked on myself as a professor seeking to find unusual creatures in the British countryside and making a catalogue of them. I'm up to about 30 or so at the moment and I need a few more before I've got enough for a book.
feel going to now. I like I've designed many covers for science fiction paperbacks for publishers on both sides of the Atlantic and in the early days many of my covers were upon Michael Moorcock books and I remember Moorcock saw my work and uh, approached his own publisher and asked if they could use my work. Uh, so we had a, a mutually agreeable relationship in those days which culminated in the, um, the book Elric at the End of Time. This is a Duke's chariot racing across uh, a rather uneven ground at breakneck speed, inviting disaster, with uh, Elric and an assortment of um, individuals from the end of time. If I were not an illustrator, I'd probably be a musician. This is my uh, second passion. And uh, this uh, encore at the end of time presented me with the opportunity to illustrate exotic instruments. And uh, I must confess I'd really like to see some of these instruments made up and, and used.
Here we are at the dragon colony, and this time I've designed dragons with uh, multifaceted eyes, like flies. Very noisy scene here, and I couldn't resist just putting a couple of cigarette packets in the nest, just to remind me of when I used to smoke. Kurutuma has an African flavour to it, but also the, the huts, the beehive-like huts, were inspired by the work of the, the houses of the Marsh Arabs in Iraq. This image is mild compared with some of mine, and it's sold very well as a poster. It out, outsells most of my other posters. And here I tried to achieve a feeling of vertigo with the, the cliff in the foreground, but I also wanted a, a vast distance with the, the mountains being a very long way off. And I achieved this with um, the use of the airbrush and plenty of mist.
Traveler, you are brave. Rivendell, The Last Homely House, is one of my favourite drawings, not only because it was inspired by the writings of Tolkien, but also because it has the flavour, if not the actual look, of my own home in Wales. I like this image so much that although it was drawn from my 1988 calendar from Wondrous Tales, I have adopted it for my own personal logo. When I started designing book and record covers, uh, I discovered after a while that uh, people were putting unsympathetic typefaces on my designs and this upset me a bit. And so uh, I decided I'd, I'd do my own logos and my own um, typefaces which I didn't find difficult because I'd, I'd learnt the uh, principles of type design in the uh, advertising agency I'd worked at previously. And in fact, my very first job straight out of art college was to, um, to write the other artists' names on a label in different typefaces, which was then attached to their T-squares. When I started designing This redrawn image is one which has developed over many years. I like to think of it as a machine which symbolically delivers many styles of music. Originally it was used as a poster design advertising a night of music at a Bristol college. That was over 20 years ago. I've long been associated with record cover design 
and art and music have long been uh, passions of mine. It started really again with my father, the, the music, in that he was a drummer in a dance band and left an old drum kit in the house one day and I decided I'd try my hand, thinking I could become a famous rock star in a week. Um, it didn't turn out like that and for, for years, through various different bands, I tried to combine these two interests, art on one hand, music on the other. This is my third record cover design for the band Magnum and it's become one of my all-time favourites. I wouldn't part with the original. It was designed partly by the lyric writer Tony Clarkin who gave me a pencil sketch but I did manage to get one or two of my own items in it, notably my dog who's asleep under the table. No, I didn't choose that one. No, not that one either. Yes, that was the one the band finally chose. With a title like Aqua, I had to get some water in this one somewhere. But there's a paradox here in that, uh, whilst from one point of view you can see this as being an underwater scene, it can also be viewed as a space scene.
This one is a record album cover of you over Isengard and represents a coming together of three separate talents, the writing of J.R.R. Tolkien, the music of Bo Hansen and the art of Rodney Matthews. The then unknown rock band Thin Lizzy approached me and asked me if I'd illustrate their forthcoming EP cover. And they'd seen a poster of mine at a college they played in. This was really my first full colour record sleeve job. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That was a scripture which inspired me to do this illustration for a Christian thrash band, believe it or not. And uh, before they approached me, I had no idea there was such a thing as a Christian thrash band. And believe it or not, they are just as loud as a secular thrash band.
traveller are a very lucky person. You have discovered a project that few, except the creators, have had the opportunity to see. It is a work in progress, developed over a number of years. It is an amazing collaboration between two talented artists. Discover. For a while I've had a relationship with Rick Wakeman, having produced designs for um, CD covers and uh, video box covers. And we're presently working on a, a project based on the Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible. And Rick is writing 12 pieces of music, one for each month, to be sold as a CD with the calendar, which will also contain 12 images from different chapters of the Revelation. This is from the Revelation, the last book of the Bible, and in this particular book, uh, the devil is uh, represented by a seven-headed dragon. And I like this picture because this is the one where he gets his comeuppance at last.
Traveler, you are brave. Traveler. What did you see? Lord Jagged Swan was drifting down. The pale yellow draperies billowed. He was somewhere amongst them. They heard his voice. My dears, how convenient. I did not wish to become involved with your party, but I did want to make a brief visit to congratulate you upon it. A beautiful ambiance, Amelia. stupor of abandonment, I heard a terrible voice that bade me rise from the ground on which I was lying. And lifting my head a little, I saw a hideous demon of gigantic frame and stature, with eyes of scarlet fire, beneath brows that were coarse as tangled rootlets, and fangs that overhung a cavernous mouth, and earth-black teeth longer and sharper than those of the hyena. In length of body, it is exactly 28 feet. In its widest part, it is 8 feet through laterally, and it is some 6 feet through from back to belly. Four great flippers, rudimentary arms and feet, and an immensely long, sinuous, swan-like neck complete the creature's body. Its head is very small for the size of the body, and is very round. And a pair of long jaws project in front, much like a duck's bill. Its skin is a leathery integument of a lustrous black, and its eyes are enormous hazel optics with a soft, melancholy stare in their liquid depths. She called Guild from his winter cave, and he came to her, soaring slowly above the trees, a great dark shape against the stars. She looked deep into his green eyes. Can you carry a man, a woman, and two sacks of books on your back? She felt a tremor of joy in his mind, like a flame springing alive, forever. As his dead servant, this lord of the dark tower over the smaller Thass. But his head was bare, and he carried no weapon save a slender black rod topped by the bleach-boned skull of some small animal. His skin was pallid white, showing the more so because of the darkness of his mail. Europe was on his feet, his axe ablaze as I had seen Ice Tongue. That blade lay on the ground. I saw Thaz dart to seize it, leap backward again with a guttural cry. I held on to consciousness with all of my strength. It was two men. One older and one younger, with long hair on their backs, chest, and legs, and with somewhat longer arms than we have. One of them was carrying some scraggy dead animal. 
and the other had a couple of spears resting on his shoulder. They looked like monkeys with intelligent human eyes. They uttered some strange sounds. Because it lay hidden in the last few folds of wooded hills before the low country began, the shot tower, despite its hundred foot height, came into view without warning. It seemed to step suddenly out of the mountain granite and across the road to block the way, or to have stood up suddenly from sleep on hearing the approach of a man. For over two centuries, it had no human company. They were mounted on beasts whose bodies were covered in thick, scaly skin resembling plate armor. They had four short legs and cloven feet. A nest of horns jutted on heads and snouts, and small red eyes gleamed at them. The riders were covered from head to foot in red garments of some shining material, which hid even their faces and hands. constantly flirting with disaster. If we slowed our pace for sweeping, the enemy could either overtake us or move to intercept. So we flirted with death, sometimes plunging recklessly ahead, sometimes rolling as we turned to free our flyers of the enemy clinging to our wings, threatening to drag us down to the ground with the sheer mass of their numbers. At the top, we found ourselves on a narrow platform of rock from which more flights of steps led upwards toward the gates of the settlement. Above that, again I could see a great mass of masonry towering from west to east, with lights showing through a great number of openings that rose in tiers over one another, as if there were dwellings story above story. Somewhere in those enclosures, my father was waiting for me.
people have created between Earth and the end of time.